Hello, and welcome back to the Ohama Home Conversation Series. This week, we are joined by artist Nadia Bamad Hajj, who is now based in Jakarta. Her installation titled Quiet Rooms was part of our latest exhibition that was held in collaboration with Singapore Art Museum. So thank you for being here. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. So what was the process behind making this art installation? I was invited to the Jogja Biennale in 2009, actually. And I was really happy to be invited because I really like making work for a home audience. By that time, I had lived in Jogjakarta for about seven years. And I was familiar with the people and some of the cultural intricacies of living in the city. So I really liked to respond to a home, a home show, if you like. I wasn't given much time to prepare for the Georgia Biennale. So what I decided to do uh, that year was to make work about something that was on the forefront of my mind and something that I was experiencing in the most immediate sense. I had married my husband, Ari, two years before in 2007. And it was two years into our marriage and we were under incredible pressure, external pressure to reproduce, to have a child. I really thought that after I was married that I would be free from this kind of social pressure. I mean, I had a lot of pressure from my dad settled down and Ari and I had been pretty much living in sin for a few years before we were married. So I naively thought that after we were married we could just enjoy the legitimacy of our cohabitation and you know kind of be left alone nothing was further from the truth the pressure to reproduce was overwhelming and we kind of received this within the community that we lived in from random strangers that we came across or had conversations with and most particularly from my mother-in-law who incessantly asked us when we were going to give her a choo-choo when we were going to give her a choo-choo yeah i wanted to talk about about an example of what was happening. So we moved into this community, this kampung. Uh, in Indonesia, a kampung refers to your neighborhood. So we moved into this kampung when we were married. Mm -hmm. And the first thing we did was hold a slamatan at the house to introduce ourselves to the local community. Tradition in these meetings is that the head of the household attends the meetings. So the meeting was predominantly attended by men. In fact, I think I was the only woman in the room. Uh, and we were asked to introduce ourselves. So Ari introduced himself and I introduced myself in the context of my work. What I did as a visual artist, uh, how I came to be in Jogja under a fellowship, what my interests were. And I was interrupted in the middle of my introduction by one of the men at the meeting and asked point blank, but when are you going to start a family? So contextually, I was thinking last night that up until the time I got married, I had been in quite a privileged position. I had gone through a very good education and I had acquired work based on that good education. I had worked in NGOs for about seven years and I had got the fellowship to come to Indonesia and I had pursued a career basically. So fundamentally up to that point I was valued for the work that I had done. But after we were married there was a very clear message that I had to fulfill a role as a woman, a biological role, a reproductive role, and I had to do it as soon as possible. Fundamentally, the work quiet rooms, the installation that you see behind me, came out of all that pressure and all that expectation of my gender. And in the middle of all of this external pressure and all of these comments and rebuke and questions, we had one miscarriage and one failed IVF. So the work quiet rooms was basically a response to all of those things, the stress and the pain, the incredible waste of money and the, the excruciating emotions. Um, of trying and failing to get pregnant within that incredible external pressure, social pressure. I'm really sorry that happened. That <laughs> sounds so tough. Yeah, I'm laughing about it now, but as I was writing notes for this meeting, it, it really hit some old nerves, actually. Can you talk more about the meaning and themes conveyed by the symbology embedded within your works? I normally start an installation by working out the pieces on Photoshop first. And I had photographic references. Yeah, I played around with the composition on Photoshop initially, and then I started on each individual work. 
from memory, I started with the self-portrait, which is on the bottom right hand of the screen. And actually the entire installation is embedded also with little signs and graphics. So I'll, I'll kind of go through it one by one. The self-portrait on the bottom right is of me with my mouth kind of pursed like this. And that was kind of in reference to uh, the fact that I didn't know how to answer the incessant question of when I was going to get pregnant. So I would just keep quiet about it and eat my feelings, if you like, makan hati, because I couldn't answer the constant question of when, 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 particularly from members within my husband's family. If you look a little closely at that component, the eyes of the portrait, I've embedded some architectural references, architectural drawings. Now, the reason why I did that was I wanted to refer to space because I was very interested in architecture at the time. And I wanted to re refer to the space of our home and how it was pretty much empty of the sounds of a busy family and empty of the sounds of children. The second component that I want to talk about in this installation is the portrait of my husband, Ari, which is the large male figure with the Medusa hair and the Medusa snake hair. So in previous work, I'd used the Medusa figure quite a lot to reflect my own personal states of anxiety. And I portrayed my husband, Ari, as similar to me in that he was in a quiet state of anxiety about all the incessant questions and about the fact that we weren't being able to conceive at the time. But I also quite liked the idea of a male Medusa. Medusa, of course, is a, is a female icon. And the whole issue of reproduction is very much female-centered. So I wanted to imply that Ari was as much affected by what was happening to us. So I, I made him a Medusa. <laughs> the difference was Ari was a lot more patient about the whole cultural experience of the pressure to reproduce. And it wasn't as much of a culture shock for him as it was becoming for me. On the top right hand of the installation is the Mega Mendung motif. I use this motif in the installation to make reference to location. I mean, the Mega Mundo motif is very Javanese. It originates from the northern part of Java. Now, the difference is it's a batik motif. And when it's used in batik, it's normally very colorful and very vibrant. But the way I've used it in this installation is... Of course, because it's monochromatic, it's dark and stormy and cloudy. And I've eventually used the Megamundung in similar ways in other works as well. But if you look closely uh, at the detail in the Megamundung drawing, there's a little graphic of an airplane, <laughs> a very flimsy airplane. So the Megamundung was primarily a reference to turbulence, to a kind of grim cloudiness. And at the time I had a terrible fear of flying, so to imprint a plane in, in a big uh, gray cloud was uh, apt <laughs> at the time. <laughs> On the top left of the installation is the component of a roof structure, as you can see. Now, it is also another Javanese reference because in many of the roof structures around Jogja, there is this kind of lintic form, which I think has evolved from uh, Wayang iconography. And from what little I've observed, that kind of curved reference is, I think, from the wings of a Garuda. I'm not quite sure. But there are many such forms around my kampung here. And so it's another reference to location and being Java or Jogja specific. Embedded in that drawing, on, on the right side of that drawing, is um, a graphic of an inner ear. Basically, for me, that roof form was about my neighborhood, about neighbors, about them constantly listening into what was going on between Ari and I as a newly married couple and as a new couple in the community. I have to convey a story about that. Sometime, definitely before I make quiet rooms, I was walking down the street of my neighborhood to go to the shops, I think. And there's a woman who 
lives across the street from me and she's lived there this whole time. And she yelled out from across the street, Sudah berisi, <laughs> translated means, are you filled? Now, what she clearly meant was, are you pregnant? Yeah. And she and I had never been formally introduced, but I was just mortified that she would yell out something so intimate from across the street about something so private. And, and that had happened right after my first miscarriage. So basically what I did was I marched across the street and I told her about my miscarriage in graphic detail. <laughs> And she has never spoken to me since. And that was the point of that exercise. I, that was the only way I could make her mind her own business, basically. Roof structure is kind of a reference to the local neighborhood and the constant listening and comments uh, that I was receiving. At the bottom left of the installation is two forms of a loud hailer or what is referred to here as Toa. Toa is the brand name of a loud hailer, so everybody calls it Toa here. In this kampung that I live in, we have a loud hailer also across the street from me, and it's used to disseminate information about what's happening in the neighborhood. So for me, symbolically, it was a symbol of the dissemination of propaganda. And I think it's been used by other artists in Jogja for similar reasons as well. Yeah, it symbolized the dissemination of propaganda and the particular constructed status quo about what Ari and I were supposed to be and what we were supposed to do as a newly married couple in the community. And embedded in that image, in that drawing of the Toa or the Loud Hela, is a, a little graphic of a dog. Uh, <laughs> so I was struggling to remember why I did that actually, but I think it has some reference to barking and the incessant noise that comes out of such an object. So those were the peripheral components and the portraits of Ari and myself. But central to the installation, even though it's the smallest component, is the image of the uterus, which sits in the middle of the installation. For me, it's the most loaded image and contains the most information, I think. First of all, it's a cross-section of a uterus with ovaries. And the left ovary I've depicted with as a closed mouth. For me, it implied that my ovary was silent to the expectations that I had of it and that other people had of it. And I kind of liked that. But at the base of the empty uterus, I installed a graphic of a panopticon. A panopticon is a design of a prison by an architect called Jeremy Bentham. The prison is designed in such a way that the prisoners cannot see each other, but they can only see the prison guard that is watching them. So a few years before making this work, I had done a little reading on Foucault's theory of surveillance. And Foucault himself had uh, used the panopticon to illustrate his ideas on surveillance. In Foucault's theory of surveillance, it implies that if you're in a constant state of being watched, you will begin to regulate your own behavior or your own actions according to what is expected of you. And when he made reference to the panopticon, he basically summed up that prisoners would start to regulate their own behavior because they knew they were being watched by one person and that was the only person that they could see at that particular point. In Foucault's theory of power, he kind of illustrated that a successful expression of power is one that does not need to use force, but can coerce its subjects into regulating their own behavior. I wanted to include the graphic of the panopticon on the uterus and the story behind it because I fundamentally felt that I was in a constant state of surveillance with regards to my reproductive choices and my reproductive condition. And ultimately, all that surveillance, you know, the comments, the pressure from my mother-in-law, the kind of little digs from almost everyone around me, mean that I did regulate myself according to this external pressure, according to this external surveillance. We did try very hard to get pregnant, and we spent a lot of money trying to do so as well. And it was difficult. <laughs> so the... Final component is the 
texts that's behind my head. So throughout the whole installation, there is an element of silence. The silence on my part, uh, with my mouth firmly closed in my self-portrait. The silence from Ari in his state of anxiety with the Medusa snakes. And the silence of the left ovary. And then we have the dissemination of propaganda with the Toa here. But I wanted to include something loud and that kind of brought the whole installation together. And I did that in the text that I included in the installation. So the jagged text are the words do'aya, do'aya, do'aya. And in the context of Jogja, do'aya means just pray or pray for what you want or I'll pray for you. And the term do'aya was always delivered to us after the conversation about uh, us getting pregnant. Why aren't you pregnant? When are you going to get pregnant? Do'aya, which means I will pray for you to get pregnant as soon as possible. It's more cultural than religious. It's an expression of hope, really, from most people. And it's something that I'm not used to, but I understand where it's coming from. But I think I represented it in this way in the installation because I was most grated by the term do'aya when I received it from doctors. We went to see a lot of doctors during that time to kind of figure out why we weren't getting pregnant as soon as possible. And, you know, after numerous expensive consultations that basically gave us information that either we couldn't understand or didn't make any sense, the doctor would always conclude the consultation with the words do'aya, and for me, it was just ironic, kind of men and women of science would deliver this note on religion at the end of what was supposed to be a scientific consultation. So I kind of was interested in the irony of that, really. So what does the title Quiet Rooms mean to you? So at the end of kind of compiling everything together, I decided on the title Quiet Rooms. So Quiet Rooms referred to our home as something quiet, devoid of the sound of children and the busyness of family. It referred to my uterus, which was then a quiet space. <laughs> but when I think back now, it also referred to the quietness between Ari and I, between my husband and I. Because despite going through everything together, we never really stopped to kind of unpack or deconstruct the psychological pressure we were under as a couple from all these kind of incessant comments. We never really stopped to talk about it and to make a firm decision about what we really should have done in the light of all that intrusion into our privacy, basically. It is interesting to see Tolka works cut out and protrude from the gallery wall instead of being confined within a framed canvas. Does a specific arrangement reflect the autobiographical narrative? For me, there is some reference to the spatial arrangement of the work was primarily aesthetic. I'm someone who's really obsessed with composition and I wanted the elements of the work to kind of dance around each other, really. And when I made the work at the time, I was really not interested in whether or not it would sell. So it's uh, important to remember that for me, this is one installation, not seven works. And the arrangement of it was critical because it was the way I designed it. And the aesthetic parts were supposed to play off each other in terms of the spatial distancing and the distance from the wall. So like I said, I first played around with the design on Photoshop. And when I installed it, in the Jogja Biennale, I decided on the distances of the parts to each other, which I then documented meticulously. I have to say that it's a difficult work to own. And every time you install it, you have to go through this rigorous measuring process. And I have uh, come into conflict with uh, at least one curator about how it should be installed, because I really wanted it to be installed exactly as I designed it. Fortunately for me, the person who was responsible for installing this work at Ilham, who was Lewis Ho, who previously worked at the Singapore Art Museum, 
really did a perfect job of it, I think. And I was really inspired to see it the way I had designed it again. The work was unframed because that really wasn't a priority for me in 2009. I wanted the shapes of each part to relate to each other without the hindrance of a square frame. I just wanted to play, basically. And Georgia Biennale gave me the opportunity to do that. So I've made at least two installations like this since then, but I've never really had the opportunity to hang the installations unframed. So whatever installations I've made since then have all been framed. So I just wanted to end this interview with a little post Quiet Rooms story. So about a year after I made this installation in 2010, and that was exactly a year after we had gone through the failed IVF. I was sitting in my office, minding my own business, and I received a call from the IVF clinic in Surabaya that we had been at the year before. And it was the first day of Ramadan, and I had made a commitment to fast that year. And the woman from the IVF clinic was on the phone to me, and she informed me that I still had another three fertilized eggs in the lab in Surabaya. And because I had not gone back to have them inserted in E, that the clinic was going to destroy them. And, you know, I have to qualify the fact that I'm not uh, a pro-life person, I'm a pro-choice person. And I knew that she was talking about cells. She wasn't talking about our children. But the way she conveyed the information to me, I can still hear her voice today. She said, Yang sisa kemarin kita hapus ya mbak. So the eggs that you had from the previous year, we're going to destroy them. And she said that in a completely indifferent tone, without any consultation or discussion or anything like that. She just identified me at the end of the phone line and told me, we're going to destroy these three fertilized eggs. And yeah, my heart just broke into a million pieces. <laughs> And I was so enraged at the way she delivered the information, the complete insensitivity of it, and it being just the culmination of all the difficulty that we had been through and all the pressure that we had been under. And because it was the first day of Ramadan, I made a very conscious decision to take a deep breath and quietly hung up the phone. Yeah, it was the most difficult experience of that whole process. And the amazing thing was at the end of that Ramadan in 2010, I became pregnant with my son Lanang, who is now nine years old. <laughs> so thanks for talking about your work with us and sharing your stories. Thanks for the opportunity, Kat. It's, it's been really great. Um, it's been really great for me to go through it again and, and write about it again as well. And for those watching, thanks for your support. If you have any questions, feel free to message us at Ilham Gallery KL on Instagram. Thanks.